Welcome to Credible Sources. Today I sat down with attorney at law Nigel Hughes on the subject the economy and justice in Guyana. Thank you very much, Sherrod. First of all, thank you for having affording me an opportunity to be in your program and allowing me this opportunity to share the research that I have gathered as a result of um, myself and, and a team of persons that we have gathered in relation to um, what happens in the economy and also what happens in the justice front in Guyana. You probably may not recall, in Jan on August the 1st, uh, actually July the 31st, I was invited by the Buxton movement, David Hines, to speak to the people of Buxton um, on the uh, commemoration of the emancipation of, of our people since 1838. And at that, on, or on that occasion, I um, indicated that there, you know, there seemed to have been an insidious transfer of uh, resources of the country, an allocation of the resources of the country to particular communities, to the disadvantage of other communities, and it needed to be addressed. Shortly after that, there was a call, I believe, from government sources that, that you know, this was um, falsely based and that they called for the evidence. Um, and I thought uh, it would be appropriate to provide the evidence because my presentation wasn't just based on the fact that I experienced this as uh, a fact of, uh, of my ethnicity, but certainly I think it was what a lot of people in Guyana experienced. So I set about gathering information uh, and research and making sure that I verified the research that came up with this uh, PowerPoint presentation called Economy and Justice. And I thank you for affording me the opportunity. I think the, the place that I'd want to start with is the budgetary allocations. As you know, the country has 10 regions. Um, the most populous of those regions is, of course, uh, Region 4. Uh, and, you know, the one that perhaps is, is least populous may well be Region um, region 9, I'm not sure. But in the presentations uh, to the Parliament by the Minister of Finance in his budget presentations, um, in relation to the allocations for Region 4, which is the capital of Ghana and in which we should note 41% of the population reside, $781 million was allocated to Region 4 for development in Region 4. Region 6, where 15, 15, maybe 18 percent, um, looking at the last census figures there, 15 percent of the population reside in Region 6, and that region, as you know, is predominantly Indian, uh, 962,500,000 as compared to 781, where 41 percent of the population resides, and of course in Region 3, where approximately between 18 to 20 percent of the population reside, um, $890 million was allocated. And whether you look at that as a, at first blush, or whether you look at that um, in a, with, in a, with a detailed eye, I think the figures speak for themselves, where you have a concentration of most of the population, which is predominantly African Guyanese in Region 4, they get 781 million, and the other two regions, which are nowhere close to a uh, similar percentage of the population, they have exceeded the budgetary allocation for the region significantly, despite uh, the percentage of the population. I think it would be appropriate at this stage to perhaps go to what happens in the allocation of uh, uh, resources by the Ministry of Housing, which as you know is one of the larger ministries and that is tasked with uh, signing and awarding government contracts. And here um, I'm just going to look at the three largest locally funded uh, allocations and this is through the budget and this is what we have um, the ministry of the ministry of housing as you know um, the three largest projects that they have ever awarded uh, through chpa is the schooner project which is 11 billion dollars that's the crane road project we have the mandela Eccles project 2.3 billion that's the four lane project and then we have the Eccles to diamond project which is $13.3 billion. And we're just going to look at this in terms of uh, the ethnicity of the companies that have been awarded and, the, and where the resources are going. So if we look at the schooner to crane, that's an $11 billion project. And these are the companies that have been awarded. VR Construction, $849 million, Indian Guyanese. Avinash Contracting and Scrap Metal, $992 million, Indian Guyanese. Lehurst Construction, 
and Services Limited. Now, this is a particularly interesting allocation. $2.1 billion has been, this contract has been awarded to this company that has no prior history in railroad construction. So this is not a case where you're saying that the company uh, existed, it's built up a lot of experience in, in road construction over the years. This company has no prior history. And what is even more interesting is that Empitab, when they awarded this contract, this bid was, there were 16 other bids that were lower than this bid to this company that had no prior um, history in road construction. And surprisingly, they win the contract. We then go to number four, Guy America, $2.65 billion allocated. Indian Guyanese company again, that has no prior history of road construction. Number five, AGM Enterprise, $1.8 billion, no prior history of road construction. Uh, Vows Construction, $1.3 million, $1.3 billion, sorry, that's an international company, um, but I believe uh, we'll get the details on them. Puran Brothers, we're all familiar with that. One billion dollars Indian Guyanese. Eight, GS Guyana, Indian Guyanese, 927 million dollars. We then look at the Mandela to Eccles four lane project, 2.3 billion dollars. Guy America, 555 million Indian Guyanese company. Mutsul, Construcciones Limited, Brazilian Indian Guyana, uh, Joint venture company, $364 million. Three, Puran Brothers Disposal, $360 million. So none of these three top companies on this is Guyanese. If we go to the next slide, now coming in at number four, for the first time in the Mandela to Eccles Road, you will see Colin Talbert and Aaron Lau. That's a, a joint venture of the two, $256 million. And then you've got Aronco Services, 471 million Indian Trinidadian company and then you've got JS Guyana Inc 352 million uh, Indian Trinidadian company and if we look at the Eccles to Great Diamond uh, allocations here we have S. Jack Mohan 1.2 billion dollars Indian Guyanese company China Railway very familiar with them 1 billion Chinese uh, that's a Chinese company in Ivor Island for the first time in African Guyanese appears in the Echoes to Great Diamond Bypass, he got $825 million allocation. And that's the central housing and planning in terms of how they have allocated. I want perhaps to just look at some of those numbers. So out of $27.1 billion, 17% was awarded to an African Guyanese uh, company. That's just in the three largest road construction entities. We go now to water treatment plants and supplies by the Guyana Water Inc. Six billion dollar uh, award. Number one, Compass Industries, you, you see them listed there. Compass, 424 million. H. North and Sons, 593 million. DR, DNR Construction. On all of those, um, the, their ethnicity is identified uh, in the right hand column. And you will notice none of those eight, none of the eight companies awarded any of the contracts for water treatment plants and supplies is African Guyanese, either individually or in terms of uh, a, co a corporate or business entity. Um, this is a classic, Ministry of Health Procurement of Drugs. The total capital expenditure, $19.1 billion only two companies only two companies are awarded that total capital expenditure new gpc 13 billion dollars representing 68.43 percent of the total budget and as you know new gpc is an indian uh, company western scientific which got the rest of the budgetary allocation for drugs 5 billion, 5.1 billion, that's 27.17% of the total budget, and that's an Indian Trinidadian company. So, in the procurement of drugs and equipment by the Ministry of Health, 100% awarded to persons of Indian heritage, 68% awarded to an Indian Guyanese entity, 
and 27 to an Indian Trinidadian entity. We now move up and I really want to get to uh, what's happening in oil and gas. So as we know, a series of exploratory uh, permits and licenses were issued by the government over the years. Um, I set out here the various blocks that have been uh, currently awarded. None of these, and I go to those that have been awarded to Guyanese, the two that currently are in the hands of Guyanese are in the hands of Indian Guyanese in the case of the Kanji block and Kaicho block, uh, Portuguese Guyanese. Not a single, and I, I really want to come to this slide, there was no advertisement, not a single advertisement for the offer for sale of any of these offshore blocks. These were just handed out by the government. And not a single block was given to anybody of African Guyanese descent. Today, I read that the, the president said that they're putting the remaining oil blocks up for public auction. So what has clearly happened here is after they have allocated the blocks to the various international companies and to the two Indian, well, one Indian Guyanese, one Portuguese Guyanese entity, and none to any African Guyanese entity, they're now putting that out for international bids, which should have happened at the start before any blocks were allocated. And so we are in the position where no African Guyanese nor any African Guyanese entity has ever been awarded an offshore block in Guyana. Now, to really appreciate this in context, oil for sure, gas maybe, oil for sure is going to drive the development of this country for the next 20 to 25 years. I do not see any other aspect of the economy being able to rival it, both in terms of size, magnitude, and definitely scope, none. So for the next 20 to 25 years, no African Guyanese will be awarded an offshore block because with this present offer that has been or offered to the public that is just announced today by His Excellency the President, I don't think there are any remaining offshore blocks. So the future of the country means that the only blocks that were awarded to Guyanese were awarded to Guyanese who were not African or entities that were not African Guyanese. And we now see the impact of that when we look at the question of the shore bases. For those who are unfamiliar with oil and gas, a shore base is the port or wharf from which all the supplies that go out to the FPSOs, which people commonly refer to the oil rigs, all the supplies leave by means of supply and support vessels and the waste and other products uh, that are utilized and deployed for the extraction of oil offshore come back. So the offshore base is almost a license to print money. Right now we only have one offshore base that is operating in Guyana and that is the Guyana shore base. The very, very rapid development program of Exxon and it is almost unprecedented in terms of global history of oil and gas. So it's not just unprecedented for Guyana, it's unprecedented globally. Now that will have to be driven and supported by shore bases. So shore bases are critical to the development of the country. And so the persons that get licenses to operate shore bases are literally going to be able to print money because everything will have to go through them. We've got yellowtail development and other developments coming. Of the three shore bases that have been approved, we have one that is operating, which is Ghana Shore Base, which is uh, estimated value somewhere around 100 million, probably a lot more than that. That's an Indian Guyanese company. In Region 3, the government has already indicated that they have awarded a license to NRG Holdings Inc. They, by their own publication, said that that's somewhere between 200 to 600 million dollars to establish uh, that base. That the company is, of course, Indian and Portuguese Guyana. 
uh, that's in Region 3, just to the mouth of the Demerara River on the left-hand side. And the other base uh, company that has been awarded a uh, shore base in Region 4 is Krong Mining. We don't have the figures and the uh, size of that, uh, the cost for that base, but it is an Indian Guyanese. So none of the shore bases, not one single shore base that has been licensed and that will be authorized to provide support for the offshore industry is African Guyanese. Just think of that in terms of context and its implications for the future. This is pretty significant numbers. Gold. Well, for a long time, before we found oil, gold was carrying this country. Um, it certainly wasn't sugar because sugar was making a profit, and it certainly rice carried it to a certain extent, but not really. We had the special petro uh, deal with Venezuela, but it was the gold that really balanced the economy before we found oil. Now, critical to the ex <laughs> critical to being able to sell gold internationally, because that's where you generate the foreign currency, not what you sell in the local market. The real money comes from the sale of gold internationally, because you get hard currency, uh, you get paid in US dollars, depending on what the prevailing price is. So gold export licenses are of immense importance and generate lots of money. In 2021, the government issued 11 licenses. Nine of those licenses went to Indian Guyanese, two went to African Guyanese. So in other words, 18% of this population were African who were allowed to export gold. All the rest of persons who were allowed to export were not African, Indian. If we move to this year, the government reduced the number of licenses. So just think of the amount of gold going out and less people being authorized to export it. Six licenses were granted. Five went to Indian Guyanese and only one went to an African Guyanese. 16%. So of the persons authorized to export gold from Guyana and sell gold for hard currency, 16% or one Guyanese was granted a license. Five Indian persons were granted a license. We now perhaps come to the most critical sector after oil and gas for future development. As you know, as we move forward, the country is obviously going to develop because of the revenues that come here. Two products that we have in Ghana are going to be critical, sand and stone, because to build the roads, to build the hotels, to build the high rises, to build the new buildings, to build the schools, to build everything that is required for major infrastructural development, social and business, will have to be constructed. And so the question of the quarries, who owns the quarries is going to be of seminal importance. Because if you own a quarry license, then given the demand, the increasing demand, every port that has to be built, every shore base, every road, every culvert, every new school, every hotel, and we're building a lot of those, every, every road to the interior, the road to Lethem, all of those will require sand and stone. And Guyana has no shortage of these. And so the development of the country is going to require the, the sale of a lot of sand and gold. So let us look at who actually has been awarded the sand and stone quarry licenses. RMC Silica, uh, African Guyanese company. The rest, let's look at them. Black Jaguar Investment Group, Indian Guyanese. Vishwa Baicha, Indian Guyanese. Elithia Investment and Construction, up to the time of this publication, I was unable to identify uh, the ethnicity of that company. Then you have Hades World, Indian Guyanese. They have four such licenses, followed by Metallica Guyanese, the only other African Guyanese company that has been awarded a quarry license. Uh, that's Metallica. We then have Southern Cantonese, Southern Canton International Trading Inc. Chinese, that's Mr. Su of Mr. Su's fame. Uh, we have then York Investment. I can't really say who they are. Lorenzo Afonso, Portuguese Guyanese. Mahendranath Udit, Indian Guyanese. Pradeep Abdul, 
Indian Guyanese, Malali Quarry, Indian Guyanese, Guanzhou and Jai Ping Chi, Chinese, Tri Country Inc., Indian Guyanese, Barakara Quarries. This is a very old quarry. They have been quarrying for a long time, at least four decades, I believe. They are Indian Guyanese. BK Quarries, maybe about 10, 15 years. I'm not sure the exact length of time. Indian, BK has two licenses. And then we come to the last two, Tulsi Pasad Quarries. That's an old established quarry. They have been around for at least 30 years in this industry. And we have Mr. Prabhu Dial, Ram Dial, Indian Guyanese. Let's just look at the numbers there. Of the 22 quarry licenses, only two were issued to Guyanese of African descent. And instead of nine, that should be, uh, yes, 9% of the quarry licenses, only 9% of the quarry licenses were issued to African Guyanese. So just think about that. Out of 22 quarry licenses, we could establish that only two were issued to African Guyanese entities. So 9% of the quarries which are going to drive the development of this country in terms of stone and sand, two out of 22 awarded to African Guyanese. You can just look at that in terms of its impact on the economy going forward for the next 20 years. Because we are going to be constructing for that period uh, a lot of roads, a lot of shore bases, a lot of bridges, um, a lot of ports. Um, the road to Letha may be completed. I know right now they're working on the road between uh, Linden and Mabura. You've got the road uh, between uh, Mabura, Kurupukari, and then Kurupukari all the way down to Letha. That's the scope and scale of the uh, licenses and the base of the economy, which has been planned for the next 10 years. Now, we all know that between 1992 and 2015, the People's Progressive Party was in office, and then again, they returned to office in 2020. Now, the patterns that I have shared with you as a result of our research demonstrate an almost exclusive transfer of state assets to Indian businesses. And, and this scale has been going on. It's, uh, the, the budget shows it in terms of the regional allocations and just by the award of, uh, of, of the uh, various licenses. The impact of this is that the African Guyanese economy has been deprived of the opportunity to gain access to vital economic resources to develop themselves. Now, I, I heard, maybe early in the week, I read that um, a letter that by someone saying, well, this is MP tab and this is how it operates. Well, two points on that. If the policy, the development policy of the country, particularly when it comes to the allocation of uh, budgetary resources, allocation of contracts, the award of contracts, and, and oh, well, we come to licenses because that's not MP tab. If those allocations by contracts result in such a uh, preponderance of the allocations going to one community, then you have a real major problem, not only with Empatab, but with the policies which Empatab must be pursuing because it results in the transfer as a result of the application of whatever criteria they're using, the transfer of the national resources the one community in Guyana, and this is a multi-ethnic country. So if, if the results that of Empatab's implementation of whatever policy they have results in this level of imbalance, then you have a problem there. But I think it's more than that, because Empatab doesn't decide who gets quarry licenses. Empatab doesn't decide who builds a shore base. Empatab doesn't, doesn't decide who gets permission to get an offshore blocks, uh, offshore block, sorry. The offshore blocks were never advertised. And so on several levels in this country, in terms of development of all the groups in a multi-ethnic society, we have problems. Now, if you think the African Guyanese problem is severe, what happens if you're an indigenous person? Nothing, nothing in any of the allocations that I have shown you, which will impact the economic development of this country for the next 10, 15, 20 years, because that's the projected life that we are going to depend on the 
uh, on the hydrocarbons. Nothing there makes any provision for any sort of development of the indigenous community. So if you have this um, unfair, imbalanced transfer of assets to one community, you are really beginning to sow the seeds. I think you've gone past sowing the seeds. It is almost inevitable what is going to happen in Guyana. Because we know from experience, and we can look at South Africa, and, and I, I only pick South Africa as an example, because South Africa, when it was in the height of apartheid, in the 1980s and up to 1992, South Africa had the strongest economy in sub-Saharan sub Africa. You, you listen to that and, and digest it. White South Africa had the strongest economy in sub-Saharan Africa, and it had the largest economy in sub-Saharan Africa during apartheid. During apartheid, South Africa had the strongest army in sub-Saharan Africa. There was no army that was stronger than the South African, the white South African army. They went into Angola, Mozambique, they fought Swapo, they, they fought uh, Zambia, they, they defeated, and it wasn't until the Cubans entered that war that the South Africans began their retreat to South Africa. Now, Mr. Mandela, sitting in a prison cell in Robben Island, didn't bring the South African regime to its knees, even though he had high, or his imprisonment had high moral suasion. It was the unsustainability of apartheid in South Africa and the high price that the privileged community would have had to pay and were paying for maintaining that kind of community with all the resources they had, it wasn't sustainable. And it wasn't because uh, the South African government got up one morning and, and, and had a pang of conscience. We know that that is not the reason why apartheid was gotten rid of. So we, we have perhaps the most powerful example in South Africa of what happens when you attempt to run an economic system. Because they weren't running apartheid because they wanted to, they, they necessarily thought, of course they thought they were superior. But this was an economic system that was directed to make sure that if you were white, you had economic advantages that nobody else in the community had. And if in the country that had the largest economy, the best army, and in the enjoyed, do not forget, in the height of apartheid in the 80s, they enjoyed the support of the United States of America because President Reagan was in office. He was in office for two terms. And they enjoyed the support of the United Kingdom because Mrs. Thatcher was probably one of the longest serving prime ministers. And both of them provided significant diplomatic and other support to South Africa. So this was a country that had apartheid, had a powerful army, had a strong economy, and enjoyed Western support. And yet, by the time you get to 1992, they had to surrender and give up this policy. So we, we don't have to repeat history over and over. We know how many people we lost in South Africa as a result of that continuous struggle to bring justice and a better redistribution to the economy. Why is it that here in Guyana, we have to repeat the same story? It's almost as if you reinvent the wheel and you want to go through the same level of, of uh, dislocation, for want of a better word, um, when, you know, we can do better, particularly given the history of this country and our commitment to principles of equality and equal distribution. Sharon, I don't know if, if, if that, is, that is sufficient. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Hughes. I was just caught up there with just the data and got distracted. Um, I, Sorry, I, I, I forgot the solutions, but I'm sure you're going to come to that. Go, you go right ahead. <laughs> I'm going to come in at the end and ask the question. So, so I don't want to say that all is lost. It, we're never in a position where everything is hopeless. And so we have to, it's not just the question of bringing this data to you, because this data is not brought to you to shock you and then, you know, you get frustrated. I have attempted to, um, and my team I should say, have attempted to put up some possible solutions. So clearly there has been a disproportionate allocation of state resources over an extended period of time that has benefited uh, a particular community. But I do want to make this note 
it is not as if all the Indian people in the country benefit or have benefited from this allocation. That's quite the contrary. It is an exceedingly small community of about 50 families who you will see in our subsequent, um, in our subsequent presentations continuously they are the people that get the contracts in oil and gas. They're the people that control the gold economy. They're the people that control the, 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 uh, the road building uh, assets. It's, it's a very small percentage of about 50 families that there about, so certainly no more than 100 families in this country that almost have exclusive control of those resources. But to come to some of the solutions, clearly the African population is not benefiting from the current policies. And so part of that is because they're not involved in the decision-making processes. Um, as you know, there has been a recent policy of attempting to go into, go in, going into communities and saying, oh, we're giving you uh, $250,000, are we going to change your roof because you've been suffering under the roof? And of course, that always comes with the invariable, uh, you know, when people that were in office that looked like you were in office that didn't change your roof. I just want to put this in perspective. If you had a more equitable distribution of the licenses and the resources of this country, then the people in the African community wouldn't have to be sitting down impoverished waiting for you to come and give a handout or come and say you're going to fix their roof. They probably would have owned five roofs which they, from which they would have been renting out. So even if you were an employee from an African company that had been awarded a quarry license or had had been the beneficiary of having a gold export uh, license, chances are that as a result of that employment, you not only would have been able to buy one house, you probably would have been able to buy three, four houses, rent them out, and you would have been a, in an in a income generating position. What has happened now is that you're put with your, in a desperate position, your back against the wall, your hands tied around the post, so that any form of generosity, any form of I come, look, you can't afford a roof to fix the roof of your house, I will fix it to you, fix it for you, without understanding the economic policies that have led you to be in that position. So one of the solutions clearly is that the persons who make the decisions, the economic decisions, they have to be involved in the decision making of the country. Because clearly you cannot have one set of people making the decisions that have these disastrous consequences. I think like any, any project which you have to examine, we have to look at what are the barriers in the system. People, I've heard people say, well, black people don't tender for businesses, they don't, uh, they don't apply, uh, they don't get licensed. The reason why it's so disproportionate is because they haven't applied. I hate to use myself as an example. Um, as you know, um, when oil, oil and gas started, I was very active in this. There was a recent webinar, an international webinar, uh, where some good people from Suriname invited me to present on, on doing business in Guyana. And they were specifically told by high-ranking members of the Guyana government that do not include Nigel Hughes if you want this to go forward. Um, the host came back, told me, and I said, of course, I will not participate because I, I don't wish to be an obstacle. And, and that's somebody at my level. So imagine what happens elsewhere. Um, three, I just want to go back to solutions here. We have to rebalance this transfer because we have to make sure that we have the appropriate studies done to, to, to ascertain exactly what has been transferred over the last 20 to 30 years to one community. And let's pick the easiest example, the indigenous community. So if the country has had 100 billion Guyana, uh, US dollars worth of development uh, over those years, how much of that has gone into the indigenous community? Genuinely gone in. Not, not put into the community by buying tractors at election time or going around and, sh and, and sharing uh, um, funds uh, at election time or you know, slaughtering the bulls the day before election and feeding the village and say vote for me. That's not the assessment. Isn't it interesting that in no indigenous community, despite them being 10% of this population, there is not a single indigenous company that is capable of building roads even in their own community. That there is not a single indigenous uh, company or entity that is capable of building a school in their community. And this is after 50 years of independence. Clearly something is not right in what is happening. 
bring back to the solution, we have to make sure that we build assets and an asset base for those communities that have been disadvantaged as a result of the economic policies for the last 20, 30 years. And then, perhaps most importantly, we have to set criteria and manage the results of the new program that we put in place to make sure that we do not end up in this state of horrible imbalance between the ethnic communities. Because this really only has one consequence, and that's not where we want to go. That's not what you consider a multi-ethnic, progressive, creative uh, society that allows its young people to come to the fore and uh, take advantage of, of, of their truly God-given talent. Mr. Hughes, I know also uh, in this data, you talk about some justice issues as well. I'd love yeah. for you to walk us through, through that. The justice issues? Yes, okay. please and thank you. Sure. So I'll only pick the ones that, that, that are um, happened in the last two years because there's so many that happened before that, you know, to go back there already is, is horrendously painful. I'll pick Joel and Isaiah Henry in 2020, Orrin Boston in 2021, Quindon Backus 2022, and of course, Tamika Clark very recently, I think in September 2022. Joel and Isaiah Henry. Now, we had elections in September 2020, and these two young African Guyanese youths were found murdered in a back dam of a rural community, and their necks were almost severed. I say that because I attended the post mortem. Now, you would have thought everybody knows that election, uh, election time in Guyana is horrendously tense. Um, relations that were social relations that were previously cordial become cold and outright hostile so in in any election period irrespective of who wins the situation intends you would have thought that the guyana police force particularly or certainly the government of the day would have welcomed an independent international investigation into this murder so no one can remotely feel that this was politically motivated because that is the obvious conclusion people are going to come to if you find two youths with their necks severed especially if they're severed uh, found in the back dam of an Indian community and these are two African youths. So the family supporters and some civil society organizations got together, raised the funds. They weren't even asking the government to pay, the fund, to pay for this raised the funds for an international forensic team to come to Guyana to conduct this investigation. And if that team had found that these boys were murdered because of some private transaction that went wrong, that would have put an end to all the speculation. If they found that contrary to, to, the, to what the government was saying, the murder was indeed politically motivated, we would have had to have found the maturity as a country to be able to deal with that. So, funds were raised, the head of the forensic team was invited to Ghana at the expense of the civil society group um, and donors. He comes here, Dr. Fundenbeier comes here, meets with the Minister of Home Affairs, says, look, my services are available, you don't even have to worry about whether you have to pay for them. I will bring the foremost international team of forensic anthropologists to Guyana and they will help you. Outright refusal, complete and outright refusal. We don't need any help. We are quite capable of solving this. We have all the capacities we need. They then invite a CARICOM team, because all of this is post-election, of police officers to come. What do they do? They don't investigate. They come and say the Guyana police force is capable, capable, of solving this crime. And guess what? How do they solve it? They find two persons, two Indian persons, who they say confess. No forensics, nothing other than this alleged confession from these two young men is produced. And as it turned out, as these men were being taken to court, both of them loudly protested that they had been set up. If that is not enough, maybe two or three days after the Henry boys uh, were murdered. Harry Singh, young Indian boy, gets murdered in the village or two away. He gets murdered somewhere between 9 and 10 in the morning. At the time he gets murdered, 
The family of Joel and Isaiah are holding a wake, you know, the, in the country, they, they have a perpetuate. So the wake start, start at five in the morning, they're at the wake, and the persons at that wake included three of four young men who were subsequently charged, who were there all the time. They were cooking food, you know, drinking liquor. The mothers of uh, Joel and Isaiah protest. They say, look, they're not convinced that these people who you have charged with this murder are the people who are responsible. So they get vocal. And in an effort to silence them, the police then arrest the other son, the brother of Isaiah, the other son of Mrs. Patricia uh, Henry, and four other young men who were at that week as suspects for the murder of Harish Singh. Eight women go to Ivlery to give alibi statements to the Guyana police force saying these, eight, these four young men were at the wake at the house at the time Harry Singh got murdered. So they could not have killed him. They go to the station in the company of their lawyers and as they arrive at Ivlery station, they are met with 15 cameras that are dedicated police officers, 15 police officers, each with a camera, that follow these women around in the police station. It is so offensive that when they went to the washroom, when these ladies went to use the washroom, the cameras went into the washroom with them, into the private chamber of the washroom with them. And they then get arrested for going to give alibi statements. They are kept in custody for the entire day. Remember, these people come from West Coast police. And at 11 o'clock in the night, they're placed on $100,000 each. So this family has to go at 11 o'clock in the night and find $800,000 to bail themselves. Otherwise, they're, they're stuck in prison. They live in West Coast. Commercial banks have closed since 2.30 in the afternoon. So they have to travel back to the village, raise funds, and they, bail, they get bailed, and then they're required to report every single week to police station. Those four boys, including the brother of Isaiah Henry, one of them is the brother of Isaiah Henry, along with three other persons, charged with the murder of Harris Singh. And again, no evidence of their involvement, but they get committed to stand trial. Here's a sad footnote to that. Mrs. Patricia Henry, who ran behind her son, wanted to make sure that the murder of Isaiah was, was solved. After they arrested and charged her other son, was running behind him day after day, speaking to who she could, died as a result of having to deal with that tragedy. One son murdered, next seven, the other one sitting down in jail for murder. That lady died. She's not the only one that died. Her sister, who was one of the eight, who was arrested as an alibi witness, also died. So you're down to six. And we don't know what the passage of time will bring. So that's the Henry Boy situation. I come now to our in Boston. Just think about this. You are lying in your bed at 4 a.m. in the morning. You have no history of ever being the subject of a police investigation. You've never been arrested even for a traffic offense. You live in a community where they didn't even bother to lock their front doors. The Boston family did not lock their front doors. That was the nature of Dartmouth. And you're sleeping at 4.30 in the morning in your bed next to your wife, naked as you were born, and a party of policemen come into your house through the front door that is unopened. They take your daughter and remove her out of the building and then they proceed to your bedroom where they shoot you lying in your bed next to your wife. I just, I just want you to think of yourself lying in your bed. Those of you who are rich enough to live in very, very salubrious circumstances. Imagine somebody coming into your house, not a bandit, not a robber, not some deranged family member who's upset, but the police officers come into your house, into your bedroom, you're lying next to your wife and shoot you in your bed lying down 
dead. After they shot you, the first thing they do is they say, you attack them in your bedroom. Just, just think about that. You attack police officers with automatic weapons in your bedroom. Seriously? And they issue this statement saying, Mr. Boston attacked them and was shot in the process. By the time Mrs. Boston was able to speak to the press later in the day and we got a different version of events, then we got the real story and the police then retracted. No apology, no explanation for how it is they said in the first place that this man at 4.30 in the morning who didn't even bother to lock his house would have attacked men with fully automatic weapons. And so there was an outcry and the villages of Dartmouth blocked the streets and burnt. Because I just want you to think if you're lying in your bed next to your wife when you get shot by four officers lying in your bed, what your natural reaction will be. And then all the evidence pointed to murder. And what happens? They charge the police officer after prolonged protest with manslaughter. He's on bail, and we don't know what will happen to that case. I come to Quindon Bacchus. Quindon Bacchus shot six times by members of the Guyana Police Force. Six times. Unarmed African male in May 2022. Shot by police officers. Only the African officers who were involved in the shooting were charged. I wouldn't say more than that. You go work it out. And then we come to the last case that I wish to speak about in this regard, Tamika Clark. Tamika Clark, prior to this incident, I suspect most people had not heard of Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark dedicated four years of her life to prosecuting people who were suspected and charged with criminal offenses. She was with the Director of Public Prosecution's Office. Every single lawyer from whenever this country became independent and before knows that when people are arrested and police officers and lawyers rep and they hire lawyers, they are always advised, remain silent. Do not tell the police anything other than your name and address. Ms. Clark goes to Soku with her client on a Tuesday and in the presence of the police officers says to them, I am advising my client if he is a suspect, I'm advising my client that he should remain silent. So cool officers confirm that her client is a suspect because they'd arrested him since the Friday before and then sent him away on his own bail. They say to her, Counsel, if you continue to advise your client to remain silent, we will arrest you because we will arrest you for obstructing the course of uh, uh, course of a criminal in, in investigation. They actually say to her, and I think this is so interesting, counsel, you will need counsel when you bring your client back on Thursday if you continue to maintain this position. Ms. Clark returns with her client on Thursday. They are not ready for her. And she comes back on Friday. She maintains her position and says to her client in the presence of the officers, do not tell the police anything. You have the right to be in silence. Ms. Clark, African female attorney, gets arrested for telling her client to remain silent. They take away her phone, they move her up from her location, and they take her to another room where she's detained for about an hour. There's a protest. The uh, they said that they sent a file to the director of public prosecutions, and up to now, not a single charge has been brought. But Ms. Clark is an attorney. So she filed about three weeks ago private criminal charges against the officers involved, Mr. Romana, Mr. Passad. She retained our firm. And up to now, when the bailiff of the court went to Soku offices, when they knew that the officers were inside to serve the private criminal uh, charges, they were told that the officers were not there. Not once not twice, three times. And here's the most in interesting thing about the third time. I had to go to, to Soku head office this morning 
with Carol Joseph because they wanted to interview her in relation to something that happened in 2016. And this happens, of course, after she brings an action uh, in relation to the local government. When I went with Ms. Joseph to Soku today, in that office is Mr. Romana, because he interviewed her and Mr. Prasad. I messaged my office and I said, Mr. Romana and Mr. Prasad are in Soku. The bailiff turns up subsequently at Soku and they are told the officers are not there. And this is for a lawyer who has filed private criminal charges. I need not say anything else about the state of justice in Guyana. Mr. Hughes, a lot of data here that has real world implications as you've articulated uh, so eloquently. Talk to us about how do we get out from here, some possible solutions. <laughs> the, the solutions here are political and structural. Um, so you really should direct that to the political leaders about how they get out of here. What, what I will say is that, you know, and, and you may well say that I'm, you know, this is old news and I'm, I'm back at my old topic. If you have a system that says that the winner take all, the winner takes all, and the executive president can do as he wants, when the executive president does what he wants, then don't complain. That, that's one thing. But having said that, where you have policies that clearly have put one ethnic group with their backs against the wall economically, there comes a time where self-defense has to kick in because you, you're facing economic annihilation. I mean, you, you, all the sectors of the economy are dominated by one group. Uh, all the licenses that allow you to be able to dominate a sector of the community are issued to one group. The quarry license, the gold license, uh, um, the shore bases, the uh, offshore blocks. So what is this community that is now placed in a position of, of desperation supposed to do? What, what, what are they reasonably supposed to do? Um, political is one of the obvious solutions, but they, you clearly have to have a program to redress these imbalances. And it's not for me, I'm a citizen, I, I'm not in political leadership. It's, it's, it's our political leadership that have to work this out. Talking about political leadership, uh, Ralph Framkran uh, is part of the political leadership of a new and united Guyana. He said in his uh, Star of News column recently uh, that if there are uh, strong allegations of discrimination, I think he believes they are, uh, that there should be uh, an investigation done by a competent UN body what are your thoughts on such a proposition? I think one of the, the reasons people are going to the, the UN, um, because I saw somebody wrote a letter saying that you should go to the court in Guyana. I don't want to comment on that, and I'll leave that where it is. Is because we don't trust ourselves. We don't have the capacity amongst ourselves to even arrive at a process. We don't know where the results. A process that is acceptable to both sides. Now, if after 50 years or 55 years, we cannot develop our own independent processes that we trust, we don't have the institutions we trust, we don't have the processes we trust, then something else will have to come to help us because we are incapable as, as a people, completely and utterly incapable as a people, of being able to even manage our own affairs. And as a result of that, um, that is why you will see people going to the UN and other places as they, as they did in, in, in apartheid South Africa for help. Because we, we don't have the capacity. We have demonstrated that. We don't have the political will. We don't have the political capacity. We cannot solve our own problems. We, it's sad. We like children. Just wow. You know, current Vice President Bar Jagdio had a little squall with um, engineer Charles Series a couple of years ago. And one of the things I remember him saying is that he and they, referring to the people, has done more for black people than anybody else ever in this country um, clearly it's hard to see that in the data you have presented here uh, almost a decade ago Freddie Kisun writing you know I want to think it's a seminal um, essay titled ethnic power and ideological racism comparing presidencies in Guyana he makes the, the point which seems to be almost identical uh, to what your data a decade later is showing us 
Um, he says here in a part of this essay, he says, in a country where two major ethnic groups dominate the social landscape and where public realms are more suited for African Guyanese because of the sociological and educational evolutions, there is a relentless, almost frenetic process of African disappearance from all dimensions of substantial power. This seems beyond now just the public sector. And this decrease is as a result of governmental edicts, policies by the ruling elites, and the attitudes of Indian power brokers. This seems to be uh, across the economy of you, as you've articulated, at least where your data is pointing. Uh, a decade later, we've gone no place, it seems. Your reaction? <laughs> um, well, he, Mr. Kisun, described it as ideological racism. I, I prefer to rely on what the facts show. The facts that I've shared with you in, in the program speak for themselves. I think they speak for where the resources are going. They speak in relation to who is making those resources and who they're making the resources available to. So I would say it certainly appears ideological in, in, in its essence. Um, there, there are more studies that are being done. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we, we have engaged an Ivy League group to assist us with, with, with more studies. And then the, the, the professionals, the data, the data specialists, the, uh, the economists, and the others, they will say to us exactly where this is leading and what the consequences of this are on the various populations in terms of health, economic development, what this means for you know, the people who are of African descent, whose children are being educated, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're the experts. And, and that's where the discussion in Guyana has to start. We have to start with the data. There's no point shouting rhetorical statements at each other. We have to start with the data. And if, if we accept that this is what the data shows, we don't have to attribute blame to how we got here. This is where we are. The question is how are we going to move from where we are and what are the policies we are going to put in place to not only redress, redress this allocation, but also to correct the imbalance. Because it's important. You can't have, in 10 years' time, no Amerindian companies that, that are capable of running a quarry or building a road even in their own community. That's crazy. Ten years is more than enough for somebody to get a whole class series of Amerindian people to go through the university, come back, and have the next, uh, necessary skills. So if you just think of the African community, been here the second longest. So after the indigenous, is the African community. African and Caucasian. We don't really have a Caucasian community. What are the policies that you are going to pursue to redress this? Because we know, we know from the history in the world, that imbalance just doesn't last forever. Mr. Hughes, you refer to yourself in the presentation as an ordinary citizen. I am an ordinary um, citizen. Uh, uh, you, you, you helm a pretty successful law firm, Hughesfield, and so be perhaps the most successful in the history of this country. I don't know about that, but oh. you're kind, yeah. <laughs> Why do you think it's important for you to raise your voice on this date and this issue, on, on these issues? You know, um, I suppose we all have a responsibility as a citizen in this country. If, if you have the ability to speak out where you see injustice, to speak out. Um, my parents, God rest their beautiful souls, always said that, you know, if, 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 if you have advantages that can change the life of somebody else, then you have a responsibility to, to, to assist. Uh, I, I see what happens in Ghana. I've lived in Ghana. I, I haven't lived anywhere else other than when I went outside to study. And I, I realize what is going to happen to this country, perhaps, I, I believe, sooner rather than later. And, and we continue to go through these cycles in which we are at war with each other. We have never actually stopped being at war with each other. And now that we have horrendous wealth that we clearly are incapable of measure, uh, uh, managing, we've never been able to manage it in the past when we had sugar, and box like when we hardly when we had debt we could manage it much less having money now um i see where this is going to go i see every day my office is in a depressed neighborhood i see every day the consequences of exclusion i see the young girls that are pregnant at 14 and 12 uh that you know i see the men that leave school and end up as as, as purveyors of, of of pharmaceuticals um and, and you see the lives as they are completely destroyed because the system takes them one place. Uh, I think last weekend the president came through um, 
the neighborhood where my office is and said he's going to give these people jobs. Okay, so what jobs are they going to get? They're not qualified. The street floods. It, you, the rain just has to set up and flood. He doesn't bother us to fix the streets. He just say, oh, we can come and give you jobs. What jobs are they going to hold? Yeah, it, this is not the case of training. And, and one of the, um, the aspects that triggered this researcher at its release now is Impadigy. Impadigy ran amongst other great work it did. Two, two night schools for adults. One in Sapphire and one uh, in the quarantine. Can't remember exactly where in the quarantine. Night schools, Sharon, to help people who at least want to get an education so they may get a better job that they can improve their circumstances. Funding stops, shuts down. Every adult in that night school, or every person in that night school is now life changed. You know what I mean? You could either have a conversation and change people's lives, or they will have a conversation with you from the other side of an automatic weapon in your house. That, look at Trinidad and Tobago. If, if you want to avoid what is going to happen to an oil country where you got to live in a gated community. you got to drive around if you can afford a car with two security cars. Look at Trinidad and Tobago. Similar racial composition, longer experience with oil than we have. And that's where they are now. People are scared to come out of their house. And, and the crimes that happen in Trinidad, if you read about them, have an edge. It's not just a killing. It's a killing with a twist. I come in your house, I take your money, and then I kill you because you're privileged. Same thing happened in Jamaica. Now Trinidad is 55 minutes flight from Guyana. How long do you think it's going to take for the masters of crime in Trinidad to arrive in Guyana and do exactly what Trinidad did? The, crim the criminals in Trinidad do. Kidnap people, snatch people, all, all that is coming. You, you have to be blind not to appreciate what is going to happen to this country with, with what is happening now with the resources that go. And then you will get a populist leader who will come about and will, who will be fed up and said, change the system. He doesn't have to get 55 or 51% of the vote. He just needs to persuade 15% of this population with his fragile institutions, its inability to, to ensure law and order, and you have a problem. With the amount of wealth that Guyana has coming its way, we are now uh, what, what I would call an international commodity. If, if I want a particular favor, I can buy the election, 15, 20 million US dollars. I buy the government. And that has consequences. So unless we are prepared to face those consequences or have solutions for them, we better start addressing them now while we still have a chance to speak. We will speak, but you can speak before or you can speak after. And I'm just urging those that have the capacity to lead us to speak. Perfect note to end our conversation. Thank you for your time. Thank you again you. for affording me the opportunity. That's our time for today. Thanks for joining Credible Sources.